Well, we are moving in tonight into the next division, as we said, the next doctrine of the Book of Romans, the doctrine of sanctification. We introduced this this morning, and we said there are three different types of sanctification that are used in the Bible. And we have to know, if we're going to rightly divide the word of truth, to which aspect of sanctification the Bible is referring when it speaks of it. There is positional sanctification, which is perfect sanctification. That is because we've been justified. We've been gifted the Holy Spirit. Therefore, in the Holy Spirit, we are perfectly sanctified. That does not mean we are going to be sinless, but that we have perfect righteousness in us, and we are perfectly holy in the Holy Spirit. The second is practical sanctification, or what I like to call practicing sanctification, to which we enter into a partnership, a working relationship with God, where he enables us to live righteously. And that is practical sanctification. That, of course, is through yielding to the indwelling spirit of Christ. And then ultimately, we will be uh, sanctified, glorified, by the Lord Jesus Christ at his second coming. Uh, when he, well, of course, second coming in the phrase for church will take place at the coming for the church in the air, but his second coming doesn't actually happen until the end of the tribulation time and his coming then. Then he'll be coming with his saints who are now in glorified bodies, perfectly sinless. Sin nature has been annihilated. And they have a different kind of a body, not a flesh and blood body. They'll have a different kind of body. And they'll rule and reign with Christ for that thousand years. Now, we are springing forth from Romans chapter 5 and verse 2. We'll go back there again tonight. But it talks there about in this grace wherein we what? When we stand. That's our new position in Jesus Christ. It's an eternal state. And we looked at the verb tenses in, the, in that, that portion of Scripture this morning. But the new believer standing in grace results in peace with God. Now that's a different, remember. That's talking about peace with God. And our peace with God is based upon the once for all finished work of Christ on Calvary by the blood, as we read this morning in Ephesians 2.13. Our peace with God is not based upon the present intercessory work of Christ as our advocate and intercessor. Peace with God should never be confused with the peace of God. Those are two different things. One is positional, the other is practical. One's connected to our positional sanctification, which is perfect. The other one is connected to our practical sanctification, whereby when it is in place, we, are, we have the peace of God. So we have peace with God as position in Christ. Having the peace of God is dependent upon the believer resting in his position in Christ and living according to the enabling grace of the Spirit of God. So let's look at Philippians 4.4 4 tonight to start off with. We've laid the foundation for this this morning. And uh, we're going to expand upon it a little bit more tonight. Ephesians 4, 4 through 9. You can remain seated tonight and we'll have a word of prayer. The word of God says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. That's living a moderate, moderate life, otherwise not in excess. Why? Because the Lord is at hand. Be careful 
for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Now look at this. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. What's that mean? Being right with God. The peace of God, you know you're right with God practically because you're living a sanctified life. And for that moment or a few moments of time, few hours or whatever it might be of your day, you have the peace of God. You know you're right with God. In the Old Testament, this was, this was expressed by the lifting up of the hand. Raising up, what? Holy hands. They didn't just do this as a form of worship. It was to signify that all the right sacrifices have been offered. I have confessed my sins. I know God has cleansed them. Uh, I am trying to do the best I can, living the best I can, according to God's word. And I lift my hand up. Why? Because my hands are clean. That's a typical expression of of sanctification. People do it all over the place today, not knowing at all that of what it means or even of what they're saying. It says in verse 7, And the peace of God, which path us all understanding, it's incomprehensible, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Why? Because these are all things that sanctify. When you keep your mind right, that is cap uh, bringing into captivity every thought to obedience to Christ. So it's not just a matter of letting your mind wander. Now it's replacing it with something else. Not that, don't think about this, but here, think about this. This is, this is how you have a sanctified mind. And those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, otherwise he lived it, do. And the God of peace shall be with you. Now that's God's promise. That's a promise. The God of peace shall be with you. Peace, the peace of God and the God of peace. He, he is the God of peace. What's that mean? He wants it. He wants to live in that sanctified relationship with us. Father, again tonight as we open your word and begin to study the doctrine of sanctification, Lord, we are but flesh, and Lord, uh, we struggle so often with all of these issues. Of course, you told us in your word that this is the way it would be. The flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. So we cannot do that which we would. Oh God, we know this to be true. And help us to understand what it means to have the grace of God, enabling grace of God in our lives and the power that's there at our resources. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, the peace, the word peace is from the Greek word arene, and which refers to the tranquil state of the soul that is assured of its salvation through Christ and so never fears condemnation from God. That's a Peace of God. That is peace with God. That is the peace of God. We know we're right with God. And there's nothing in the world that can take that away if we are saved. Now that's a big if. That's of course the, the issue of 1 John, the if question. And the if question is, that you sure? <laughs> you sure you're saved? Now that's not just the fact that people don't continue in the faith. Some people quit altogether. Obviously they're not saved. Never were. Uh, over the years I have learned led a lot of people to Christ or they prayed the prayer at their doorstep and you've never seen them again or they get saved and they get baptized I can't tell you how many times I've baptized somebody and they walk out the church door after the service and never darken the doors again what does that tell you? 
never got saved. I'm not, I'm not going to go chase him down and say, well, let me tech- tell you about eternal security and assurance of salvation. I'm going to go to them and say, man, I'm pretty sure you didn't get saved. Uh, it's pretty obvious. You're not a workman. There's no workmanship created in Christ Jesus under good works. So go over to Colossians 1.20 with me. I think it'll be up on your screen. Patty says I have a couple verses up here that aren't there. But verse 20, I think, is Colossians 1. Now look at this. And having made peace through the blood of his cross. That is, of course, uh, peace with God. By him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they, they, they be things in earth or things in heaven, those are all reconciled. That is our concept of peace, reconciliation. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked work, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blamable and unreprovable in his sight. Look at this. If you continue. What does that mean? If you're really saved, you'll continue. Over and over and over again, we find this in the Bible. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, that's the only way God can present you holy and unblameable and reprovable in His sight. There's both positional sanctification and practical sanctification in the text. Now, it's not clear here where the differentiation is. But if you are positionally sanctified in Jesus Christ, then God can present you holy and unbelievable and unreprovable in His sight. That's positional. And I believe that's what the text is teaching. But then it goes on. It says, if you continue, showing that you really genuinely have faith, you know, have faith in Jesus Christ. Now, because the believer is justified, he has access by faith into this grace wherein we stand, Romans 5.2. Now why is that important to understand? Because it's a pinnacle verse of scripture in the doctrine of sanctification from which he's going to build all the way up to the chapter, uh, chapter uh, 8 of Romans. So if you don't understand your new standing in Christ, uh, if you are genuinely saved, uh, here you're, not, you're going to miss most of this teaching on practical sanctification. If your salvation is dependent on your practical sanctification, you're big trouble. Right? Because then every time you fail, every time you miss the mark, then you must bring your question, your salvation into question. But it's not dependent upon that. Your salvation is dependent upon your practical, your, your positional sanctification in Christ. That is the gifting of the Holy Spirit of Christ. And you are secure in that new standing. That position is a standing. It is an eternal standing. So grace like peace refers to the believer's position or standing in Jesus Christ. And when we think of the access into God's grace, it's something that happens once we are saved. We have this access. Remember, we looked at that this morning. That is a perfect tense. Once for all, forever, we have this access. It can never change. It's always right there. The believer never falls out of grace. If he's born again, he only falls into it. We have this excess. And now God's operations of grace, when you fail, are going to be different. Now they're going to move into chastisement, but it's still an act of love and it's still an act of grace. So the grace of God is like a lake in which the believer stands. We can never fall out of it. We can only fall into it. And sometimes... Then and only then do we really realize the grace of God, what it really means. Now, all of the Old Testament uh, saints uh, listed in Romans, in Hebrews chapter eleven, understood this. David, when he sinned, uh, he then gives us the great repentance psalm. I think it's Psalm fifty-four, isn't it? Yeah, and he gives us a great repentance psalm and shows us his heart. And he's restored back to the faith. 
So when we think of grace, we should visualize ourselves before the throne of God. We have this new standing. See your soul there before God at the throne of grace. It is in within his enabling grace that the redeemed reside. This is the enabling grace of God is this new creation and, and we reside there. It is our home. We're, we're already there. To live in grace means to live in the continual presence of God as his child with endless access to his presence and all the resources at his disposal. All of it. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 14 talks about this. The superiority of the new covenant. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens. That's Jesus Christ, Melchizedek in priesthood. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Remember context? There were a bunch of Jews, hypothetically, thinking about going back to the temple, to the sacrifices, to rejecting their own priesthood, uh, rejecting, of course, the church and for the temple. And uh, uh, he says, let's hold fast our what? Our profession. Now, if they go back, it's just showing that they never were saved. But Hebrews chapter 6, it gets there, it's a pretty serious accusation. It says, if you go back, if you've tasted of all these things and understood it, you go back and reject it at all, it's impossible to renew them again under repentance. It's a hypothetical situation. But if you believe this, you understand this, and then you abandon it, you're not continuing. But he says, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Now because of that, we have a high priest who understands. And we can come to him. And that's what verse 16 is about. Let us therefore come what? Boldly. Under the throne of grace. That's a distribution center of God's grace. It's right there available for everyone. So you can't ever go there and say, well, you know, I didn't have enough grace to do this this week. <laughs> That's pretty foolish. Uh, we can come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy. That's forgiveness. And find grace, what? To help in the time of, the, in time of need. Literally as much and as often as you need it. It is unlimited grace. Again, Enabling. All of that, all that we need. You come back to, I failed. I have miserably failed God. I've lived in sin. I've committed some act that is atrocious. And God can never use me again. No, no, no. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we can come before the throne of God and we can get grace to begin again. I just love the fact, I, I like dispensationalism because it is a, it teaches the doctrine of new beginnings. But not just seven. How many new beginnings did you get this week? How many did you need? What's this verse of scripture say? As often and as many in, as you need. You get a new beginning. You don't have to live in yesterday's failures. So to live in grace means that God is constantly working in our lives for our good. Uh, even though we're not aware of it, we can't see it sometimes. We know that for a fact. In other words, our new standing in grace, Romans 5, 2, affords a believer that our Heavenly Father is constantly working good in and through our lives. Because he wants to do great things with us. He wants to use us. Romans 8, 28, remember, that's one of the pinnacle texts that God is building up to as he begins in Romans chapter 5. The pinnacle statement is chapter 5, verse 2. Now he takes us over and makes some pretty radical, what we would think highly questionable statements, but God says them and we know they're true. And he says, and we know 
We know that all things work together for good to them that love God. To them who are called, this is a vocational calling, according to his purpose. God's working all things together for good. So to live within our new standing in grace means we stand secure in our salvation, live under the preserving umbrella of God's love. It is an unshakable place. And if a person is genuinely born again, again, if they are genuinely born again into the new creation in Christ, nothing can ever separate him uh, or her from that grace wherein we stand. It's a new, eternal, secure standing. This does not mean we should try to shore up and reinforce a shallow or false salvation decision by promoting assurance of salvation to false professions. I saw that happening at camp one summer, and I went up to the camp director and I said, boy, this is dangerous stuff you're doing here. You have people come forward and the counselors, young Bible college students are, they come forward and they have a question about their salvation and the counselors are talking to them about eternal security and now talking them into being that they were saved by giving them eternal, eternal security of a false salvation. I said, I want to see every one of those kids, as a camp pastor, I want to see every one of those kids who had a, uh, a decision card signed, they got assurance of salvation. And more than half of them weren't saved, and I led them to Christ someplace, having just a quiet talk with them. Boy, it's a dangerous thing to teach eternal security to people who do not have genuine salvation. And it should never be done. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 31. Again, now he's building up to this mountain peak in the doctrine of sanctification as he begins to deal here with glorification, which is the ultimate sanctification, the redemption of the body in chapter 8. Verse 31, what shall we say then to these things? What's, what's the, you know, what are we going to, if God be for us, who can be against us? That's what we say. <laughs> he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for, for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Okay, will God do it? Now, it, it is God that justifies. What's that mean? He won't. He won't lay anything to the charge of God's elect. Those who are the priesthood of the believer. That's a vocational election. Verse 34. Who is he that condemneth? Well, uh, it, is, it, is, it is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who uh, maketh intercession for us. Well, who's the one that, who can condemn you? Well, otherwise, if you're saved, he won't. Jesus won't. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Now notice it says who. But look what it says. Shall tribulation or distress? Are these going to separate us from the love of Christ? Or persecution? Or famine? Or nakedness? Or peril? Or the sword? Otherwise, even if they kill you, as it is written, he says, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for slaughter. That's not going to separate you from the love of Christ. He says in verse 37, Nay, in all these things, these tribulations, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. What does that mean? We didn't have to fight for it. Somebody's already won the battle. We are just gaining the victory. And remember, death is a victory. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? Sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But praise be to God who what? Giveth us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. We didn't earn it. <laughs> he gave it to us. And all, all these things were more than conquered through him that loved us. Now answering the question of Romans 8.35. For I am persuaded. What is the question of 35? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So now in this verse... Verse 38, he answers it. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature. 
I think he's got it pretty well covered. <laughs> Shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's not talking about people who are lost and that love of God for them. It's talking about in this new standing in grace in which we have in Jesus Christ, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, you don't have a slide up there. I don't. Oh, I guess Patty says she does have this slide. At first, she said she had it. I didn't have it on the paper, but I have it. So she has it now up on there. So you can read it, right? But Jude 1 2, Jude 1 1 leads us off with this epistle. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are what? Sanctified by God the Father. This is positional, perfect sanctification in our justification. And what? Preserved where? In Jesus Christ. That's the new Genesis. You're preserved by God in the new Genesis. And you're not preserving yourself. God is preserving you there. And you are called. Now, of course, the calling here is, is uh, to contend for the faith. But he says, mercy unto you and peace and love be what? Multiply. But because a believer is justified, he has the sure hope of the glory of God. Romans 5, 2. The hope of the glory. Now when God makes a promise and you have a hope in that promise, how sure is that hope? Let me say this. It's like the old guy used to say, it is guaranteed. <laughs> right? Guaranteed. It is perfect surety. In fact, the Bible uses the word surety for the hope. So the hope of glory refers to the surety of God's promise regarding the believer's future glorification. That's Romans 8, 29 and 30. One day all believers will be changed to be like Jesus is presently. All believers are predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. We're not predestined to be saved, but once we're saved, we're predestined to be conformed to the image of Son. That's glorification. Otherwise, God's taking care of that. He has predestined that in. Philippians 3.20 says this. For our conversation, right in the margin of the Bible, that's your citizenship and your accountability before heaven. For our conversation, our citizenship is in, now this is important, right now you are still alive walking on planet earth, but right now your conversation, your citizenship is already in present tense heaven. God's already transferred your citizenship. When you were baptized with the spirit of Christ, you were baptized, your baptism Removed you from the cursed creation and immersed you into the new Genesis in Jesus Christ. And God has guaranteed it. From whence we also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. According to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. What? What is he saying? Your present state in this citizenship, even though you have it right now on earth, God is predestined that you will be there. The end from the beginning. He hath begun a good work and you will continue it. 1 Corinthians 15, 47. Here he gives this contrast between Adam and Christ as the last Adam. He says, the first man of the earth is earthy. Second man, uh, of course, this new Adam, last Adam, is the Lord from heaven. And as is the earthy, such as they that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they that are heavenly. If you're born again, you ought to be more heavenly and less earthy. <laughs> and as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. <laughs> Not going to get now. The kingdom of God is different than the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God is the eternal state, but the flesh and blood cannot inherit it. It's gotta, you're going to have to have a new body to get into the kingdom of God. 
So when God said you must be, or Jesus said you must be born again, that's the only way to get in that. And then you'll get a new body, which is not going to be a body of flesh and blood. People say, well, what kind of body are we going to get? I don't know, but it's not going to be flesh and blood. I can tell you what it's not going to be, because that's what God says. Neither doth corruption inherit in corruption. Behold, I, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trump of sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Must. Why? Because we're predestined to it. That's what God says. I didn't say it. We're predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. What God begins, God will finish. Now, we have, we probably better stop there and have the Lord's Supper tonight. We didn't get a whole lot of ground covered. But uh, uh, we'll have a word of prayer and then we'll go down and have the Lord's Supper tonight. Our Father God, as we bow before you and thank you so much for what you've given us. Lord, as we learn more from your Bible and see these wondrous things, our gratitude increases. For Lord, when we have put our salvation in your hands, we have done so eternally and you have guaranteed it. That you have sealed us unto the day of redemption. And that you have given us the earnest of your spirit will never leave us or forsake us. And Lord, that our citizenship is already in heaven. We rejoice in all of these things. We, we rejoice in the promises of your working, that you have begun a good work in us, will continue it unto the end. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well.